السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وما بينهما في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش الحمد لله الذي خلق سبع سماوات تباقا وجعل القمر فيهن نورا وجعل الشمس سراجا الحمد لله الذي جعل الشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم الحمد لله الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا الحمد لله الذي خلق الإنسان وعلمه البيان وأنزل الفرقان وعلم القرآن الحمد لله الذي لا إله إلا هو الحمد لله الذي ليس كمثله شيء الحمد لله الذي لا أحسي ثناء عليه كما أثنى على نفسه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كلامه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال لقمان لابنه وهو يعده يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه وقال تعالى أيضا وقضى ربك لا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام رضا الرب برضا الوالد وسخط الرب بسخط الوالد أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام الحمد لله After praising Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I would like to request you all to appreciate the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the blessed opportunity to come to the masjid come to the masjid and pray Maghrib Salah with Jama'ah and then sit for a while to do Muzakara to understand the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this we should be truly thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we say Alhamdulillah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions which is I'm so Rahim and Kareem, I'm so merciful. خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانَ ضَعِيفًا That I have created human beings very weak. I have created human beings very weak with limited capacity. With limited capacity. Yet, that they do not have the ability to وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا They don't have the ability to count the ni'mah, count the blessings that I'm bestowing upon them every moment of the day. It is beyond their capacity. The Mufassirin, they mention, forget about counting, that you're going to count the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is beyond your capacity. The Mufassirin, they mention that you don't even have the capacity to understand the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, they mention, forget about counting, forget about understanding. You do not have the ability or the capability to even have the imagination of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is beyond your capacity. But yet Allah says, I'm Rahim and Kareem. When my banda, when my slave, they try to appreciate, they try to appreciate by saying Alhamdulillah. What they say? Alhamdulillah. All praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they say that, I become so happy with the limited that they have done. Even though they cannot come, I say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, لَإِن شَكَلْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ The direct benefit that I give them is that I will increase my bounties upon them. So how do you understand that? That is, if you appreciate the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving you the opportunity to come to the masjid, for maghrib salah with jama'ah, you say alhamdulillah. That means what? Allah will increase his ability. You can come back again and again to the masjid. Do you understand? My dear respected brothers and youngsters, you know, today I'm here for you, okay? And I am not gonna lecture you. I am not going to lecture, we're gonna conversate. What are we gonna do? We are going to conversate. I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to answer me back. Secondly, if you do not understand anything, whatever I say, you can always raise your hand in between my talk and I will attend your call. Is that clear? But then, I want all of you to understand what I'm trying to convey. You understand? So I will not, you know, think or be disturbed by the fact that you're raising your hand in the middle of my talk. No, I will stop my talk to make sure that you understand what I am saying. And secondly, when I ask you a question, 
you should also answer me back. And if you have any question, you can also ask me. Is that clear? Everybody understood? Okay. So Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He talks about Luqman alayhi salatu salam. Who does He talk about? Luqman alayhi salatu salam. Did you ever hear of the name Luqman? No? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good, good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Holy Quran about Luqman alayhi salatu salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a complete surah with His name. A complete surah with His name. And his words were so valuable. His words were so valuable that even though the Holy Quran is whose words? Allah's words, right? It's the words of Allah. It's the kalam of Allah. But yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, he quotes the, the sayings of who? Luqman alayhi salatu salam. Puts in quotation. Puts in what? In quotation. So when do you put something in quotation? That you think your words are more valuable or their words are more valuable? When you prefer their words and when you want to convey a direct message, that's when you use what? Quotation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uses quotation to explain what Luqman alayhi had to say to his son. So do you think these words are valuable or no? They're very valuable. And He mentions 10 advices in 8 verses. How many advices? 10 advices in 8 Verses today, inshallah, if the time if a, a time allows us, we'll talk about only three verses. And he says before even he starts with his uh, quotation, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala he mentions that I have given wisdom to Luqman There is a difference of opinion in regards to if Luqman is a prophet or he is a wise man. Some narration mentions he's a very wise man. Some narration mentions what. Is it prophet? So there's a debate. But irrespective of the debate, it doesn't matter to us. Our point is that his words were so valuable that Allah Himself quotes him where? In the Holy Quran. So let's focus on the quotations. Let's look at focus on the words of Luqman Ali Sallam. The first advice he gives. His name is mentioned in Tafsir ibn Kathir, one of the explanation of the Holy Quran who writes Tafsir ibn Kathir. He writes, his name is Luqman bin Anqa bin Sadun. He even mentions his father's name and also mentions his what? Grandfather name. And it is also mentioned he was an Ethiopian slave. He wasn't a free man. He wasn't a what? A free man. He was an Ethiopian slave. He was from Egypt. Where he was he from? Egypt. He was a slave. He was, he was an Ethiopian slave. He was from Egypt. And he was a carpenter. He was what? Carpenter. Furthermore, he mentions he was a black individual. He was what? A black individual. He had thick lips. He had what? Thick lips. He had flat nose. He has what? Flat nose. Flat foot. And very short. And very short. So this is the description given by who? The Siri Ibn Kathir about Luqman. And that person, even though he's black, even though he has thick lips, even though he has flat nose, even though he's short, he is black. Yet Allah considers him to be so important that Allah himself quotes him in the Holy Quran. Do you understand the message now? That irrespective of who you are, irrespective of how do you look, irrespective of where you are from, it doesn't matter. Islam values you based on what you have in your heart. The one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most, he is the most valuable in the eyes of Allah. Even though his description was what? Against the normal, you know, things that you value. But yet, Allah valued him, why? Because he had what? Fear of Allah in his heart. So if you truly want to be valuable in the eyes of Allah, what do you must acquire? Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be where? Inside your heart. So he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that he's saying to his son, to his son, my dear respected brothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that his father was giving him what? Waz. You know you heard waz, right? Bayan and waz. My dear respected brothers, the word ya'iduhu comes from the word that means that it is heart penetrating advice. It is not a normal advice. It's what? It's not it? Normal advice that he just shout out something. No, it is what you want the advice to go where in your in, in your son's heart. He wanted to go where in his son's heart, and he wants you to make sure that it is in, in such a wording that his son understands and comprehends and puts it where instills it in his 
heart. And when he gives him advice, look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to explain here. When the father calls the son, he says, Ya Bunay. Allah says, Ya Bunay. When he calls, when Luqman is calling his son, he doesn't say, Oh my son. He does not call him Ya Ibni. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word that Luqman used. He used, Oh my beloved son, oh my small child. Do you understand? Why did Luqman answer for them to accept that message? If you do not build that relationship and you think you have the upper hand, my dear inspector brothers, you will only have the upper hand until he is 18 or 19. Then it collapses. Am I right or wrong? We have seen many parents. We have seen many parents that they think they have the upper hand over their child. It works back home, but it does not work here. You must build that relationship with your son, your child. Many of us, you know, we dedicate our work, you know, we, we dedicate our time to our work. We work from day to night. We only see our child what, once in a week. I have met many parents like that. They meet their kids what? Once in a week or twice a week. That's it. They give them one hour or two hours. And they provide for them. They give them the best of clothes. They give them the best of food. My dear speckled brothers, you also need to devote your time to your child. And you must build that relationship. That's why Luqman when he's advising his son, he makes sure that the bond is built. That bond is what? Built. He says, oh my beloved child, come close. I want you to sit next to me. I want you to what? Sit next to me. I want you to be loved. I want you to feel that love that I have within me for you. And he says, yeah, Bunay, come close to me. Then once that bond is created, when there's a relationship between you and your child, then Luqman goes on. لا تشرك بالله. The first advice that he gives to his son. The first advice that he gives to his son. He does not say, you know what? Listen to me. He does not say, I am your father, or listen to so and so, or do this and that. No. He attributes everything directed to Allah, directed to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He says, وَهُوَ يَعِلُهُ يَا بُنَيْهِ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ. Do not associate any partners with Allah. He talks about the right of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. When a child will understand the right of Allah, when a child will know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, when a child will understand the power of Allah, the qudrat of Allah, the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, definitely that child will understand your status as well. If the child does not understand who Allah is, if the child does not know who Allah is, if the child does not understand the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he or she will not know your status. It is beyond our understanding or it is something that we are wishing for, but that's not going to come into reality. So that's why Luqman makes sure that he understands who Allah is. He understands what is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you should not associate any partners with Allah. What is the first right? He's alone. No partnership at all. My dear speckled brothers, you know, I will tell you, you know, maybe you're young now and many of us are already in college. When I was taking biology, when I was taking what? No, biochemistry. The professor comes in, my, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the classroom and he says, if you do not believe in evolution, science will not make sense. Or biology will not make sense. Biochemistry will not make sense. This is the message that we get. This is what? The message that we get or we will get in the future. My dear speckled brothers and youngsters, one thing I will tell you. One thing that I'm going to tell you today, make sure you understand that very clear. Maybe whatever I'm trying to convey to you, you will not understand. Maybe you will forget it. Maybe you will forget it, but you will not stick to your brain. But whenever you, someone conveys any message to you in regards to your Lord, in regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, saying that you should associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always come back to a scholar. Always what? Come back to a story. Do not let that misunderstanding within yourself develop. If you have a question about Allah, if you have a question about Rasulullah if you have any question about your deen, the first thing that you should do, don't let that question develop. Don't let time pass on that question. Come back to the Imam or come back to your scholar, come back to your teacher, come back to your parents and ask that question right away and get that clarified right away. The more time you will take to understand or comprehend what he's asking, what he's trying to tell you, the more it will develop in your head. The more chance you will have to what? To go in a different direction. So whenever you have a question about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the religion, what should you do? Ask your parents or ask a person who's what? 
knowledgeable in that field so you can get your what? Clarification. You can get your clarification. So the first advice that he gives, Oh my beloved son, do not associate partners with Allah. That's number one. Number one, right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second, right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions another verse. Surah Bani Israel, he says, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا Allah has made the faisalah. Allah has decided that it is only, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only worthy of worship. You should not associate any partners, and you should not worship who? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No partnership, and also only in the only being that should be worshipped is what? Allah. So, after that is understood, then Luqman Ali said to some tell his child, you know, sometimes when your parents orders you something, when your parents say, you know what, do this or do that, then you develop that question within yourself, you know what, why should I do it, right? Why is he telling me to do this? Why is my mother telling me to do this? Why is my father telling me to do this? It doesn't make sense to you. That's why, when Luqman is advising his son, he also gives the reasoning. He also gives what? The reasoning. He says, La tushrik billah. Do not associate partners with Allah. Why? Inna shirka la mulmun alim. He's saying that when you associate partners with Allah, you are oppressing yourself beyond your imagination. How so? The question might arise. You know what? If I'm associating partners with Allah, how am I oppressing myself? Nothing is happening to me. I'm living, I'm walking, I'm eating, I'm talking. Right? Don't you have that question? Why is Luqman I'm telling that do not associate partners with Allah? If you do, you're doing what? The biggest oppression upon yourself. The reason behind why, because Luqman is to remind his son, he's trying to tell him, you know what? In this world, maybe you'll pass by. You don't believe in Allah. You, don't, you associate partners with Allah. You will do all the wrong things in this world. But after you pass away, who do you have to face? You could get away with lying today. You could get away with cheating today. You could get away with backbiting today. You could get away by stealing today. You could get away by hurting others today. But at the end of the day, when you are going to die, who will you stand before? You have to answer to Allah, right? Every single thing that you do, whether good or bad, Allah will take accountability. And on that day, when Allah will say that, you know what, you associated partners with me, call that partner and let him save you today. What's going to happen? There will be no one. There will be what? No one to save you. And where will you go? Hellfire. And don't you think that you're pressing by letting yourself into hellfire? Who, who wants to go to hellfire here? Nobody wants to do that. Right? Nobody? wants to do that. So for that reason, if you are trying to direct yourself, if you're walking towards hellfire, don't you think that you're oppressing yourself? You're punishing yourself? That's why he's saying that do not associate partners with Allah. If you associate partners with Allah, what will happen? You are doomed to go to hellfire. That's why he calls that the biggest oppression. The second advice he gives, my dear respected brothers and youngsters. Right after Allah, right after Allah, who do you think he mentions? What is your guess? Huh? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in this verse, in multi, many verses, he does not mention Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the surprising thing. That is something that you have to understand. You know, we have this notion as a child or as an adult. You know what? After Allah comes who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, in Iman, in, in, in Imani Taqaza, he comes. But when it comes to our akhlaq, when it comes to our behavior, when it comes to right upon ourselves, for example, Rasulullah so is not here anymore. Is he here? He's not here anymore. You must love. Like bin Ahdim wa nakuna habba ilayhi mi walidi wa walidi wa nasa jima'i. Rasulullah so said that no one will be a true believer until I am beloved to him, then his kids, then his parents, then everything else in this world. But he's not here. That is in terms of Iman. That is what in terms of your belief and creed. But you have at this present moment, at this present moment, who is more worthy of your akhlaq, of your good characteristics, of your respect, of your love, of your devotion, of your obedience? Who do you think comes first? Over everybody else. Huh? Parents. Who comes? Parents. Out of all the relationships that you have in this world, you have your brother, you have your sister, you have your co-worker, you have your friends, school friends, and you have maybe like your long distance friends or whatever you have, your relatives, first cousin, second cousin, and all these people that you have in your life, who should be given priority? 
parents. Allah says that in the Holy Quran. He says, Wabil walidayni ihsana. Right after Allah, right after Allah, the status has been given to who? Parents. My dear speaker, but is why? That's the question. Allah will explain that. He will explain the reason. But now let's briefly define or try to explain the status of the parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions <coughs> that sometimes when you are, for example, your parents are, you know, telling you uh, to do something. Your parents is what? Telling you to do something. Or is telling you to turn off the TV, do your homework, or whatever it is that you do not like, what you do not like. And you're annoyed. You are what? Annoyed. What is the first thing that comes out of your mouth? No. No. Okay, that's fine. Anything else? Yes? No. No, very good. Okay, anybody else? Natural, naturally. That is something that you have to think and say. What is it? You have to think and say yes or no. But something if someone punches you or someone hurts you, what is the first thing that comes out of your mouth without even thinking? Yes? So, like, you punch them back? Well, it depends if yes, that's right. Yes? Um, you would tell them, hey, stop. Okay, that's also thinking. But something comes out if someone punches you, hurts you, or someone in any way hurts you. Yes? Ow. Ow, yes, there we go. There we go. That's something without even thinking. Am I right or wrong? Yes. Oof! You know what's happening? You get, you get like, you know, shaken. If someone does something to you, this comes out what? Naturally, without even thinking. The no comes later, you have to think, and you have to say, no, I'm not going to do it. Or you, you want to defend yourself, then you have to think too. But that word, oof, that word, ow, it automatically comes to you, without even thinking. That's natural. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that your parents' status is beyond your imagination to such an extent that if you don't want to even disobey, if you, if you want to even obey, disobey them, you cannot even say, oh, forget about disobedience. <laughs> forget about saying no. No comes all the way down. You can't even say what? Oof. You cannot even express the, 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 the unpleasant feeling to your parents. That's how much worthy of respect they are. My dear speaker, brothers, I will tell you a story. And youngsters, you know, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, one of the most prolific narrator of hadith. He's what? One of the most prolific narrator of hadith. A person came from Yemen. A person came from where? Yemen. And he carried his mother. He carried his mother. He came to where Saudi Arabia to perform Hajj. What? Who can tell me the distance between Yemen and uh, Mecca? Anybody have an idea? I don't know. You don't know, it? but anybody can guess. Yes. Uh, Forty-five miles. Oh no no no! <laughs> <laughs> it's from one country to another country. Yes yes. No more than that. Yes. More than that. Okay, I'll tell you that number. Yes. No, no. Let me tell you. Okay, let me let me let me tell you. Let me cut this short. Approximately seven hundred miles. How many miles? Seven hundred miles. So this person is coming from where? From Yemen. He's from where? Yemen. It's an Arab country, and he is going to perform Hajj or Umrah to go where? To Makkah to Mukarramah, the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And he's traveling. How many miles? 700 miles back then there was no plane Do you understand there was no what plane there was no rails there was no like a proper me modes of transportation that we see today when going from one country to another okay yes yeah these camels but that's not that's very slow that's what very slow but now let me let me, let me tell you something else let me tell you something this person he did not even have camel he was very poor he was what very poor. So his mother was sick. His mother was what? Sick. sick. Could not walk. But she wanted to perform and see the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She wanted to perform Hajj or Umrah. You understand? So he was carrying her on his back. Carrying her on his back. My respected brothers and young he's circulating the Kaaba. He meets with Abdullah ibn Umar. He meets with who? Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, one of the most prolific narrators of hadith. <laughs> and he says, Oh Abdullah ibn Umar, I have carried my mother from where? Yemen. From Yemen, 700 miles. 
and I'm going to do the work, and I'm going to fulfill all the requirements that I have to do, and I'm going to make her happy and take her back another 700 miles back home. 1400 miles on my back. Do you think, O Abdullah ibn Umar, that I have fulfilled the right of my mother? 1400 miles on the back. And then he's asking this question Do you think that I have fulfilled the right of the mother? That after doing all this for months that I'm carrying on my back, do you think that I have fulfilled her rights? That she doesn't have any rights over me? Whatever she did for me, I'm paying her back, I'm done paying. Then Abdullah ibn Umar, look at what he said. He said, not even a single contraction, not even for one moment the pain that your mother has suffered due to you coming to this world for even single moment, that 1400 mile journey is not worth it. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions the reason the Holy Quran, that why should you be disobedient to your parents? وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا Your mother has carried you in her belly for months after months. Imagine you have a book bag. And I tell you, a book bag is approximately like you know, a couple of pounds. But an average newborn baby that comes into this world is approximately 8 pounds. How many pounds? Eight pounds, and your mother was carrying that eight pound load for months after months. Imagine you have a book bag, and someone tells you that you know what, you have to sleep with that book bag. Do you think you can sleep for a night? But your mom was sleeping for months after months while you were in her tummy. Months after months, she couldn't pass and turn. She would have to wake up after every couple of hours. Or even if after you are born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions, For two years or three years, she could not have a full-fledged, complete night of sleep. Because every two, three hours, you would wake up to drink milk. Every two, three hours, you would scream. And even though she's sleeping, she would Wake up running, you know, make your milk for you. Take care of you, change your diapers, feed you. Or when you're sick, she had to stay up the whole night at the hospital. Days after days. My dear Speck of brothers, how do you think you can repay that? 1400 mile journey was not even worth of one contraction. So you imagine all these months, all these troubles that the person, your parents have raised you to the ability that you are in. And you think you can just disobey them? That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, their status is so high that even those natural words that come from you due to displeasure, due to you being upset with them, that you want to say, oof, you don't have the permission to say even oof. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you must be obedient to themselves without any question at all. No question. You have no authority to question their right. You have no authority to question their commands. You have no authority to question their, you know, whatever they're saying, or even to be dis disobedient to them. My dear speck of brothers, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Allah has created you. Allah, Allah has what? Created you. But if you really want to see Allah happy, who wants to see Allah happy? Everybody wants to see Allah happy, right?" Look at what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying. Look at what our messenger, beloved messenger is saying. Ridha rabbi bi ridha walidi. If you want to see Allah happy, if you want to see your Allah smiling upon you, then make sure that your parents are smiling upon you. If your parents are smiling upon you, indeed you will know that your Allah is also smiling upon you. The happiness, the pleasure of Allah is directly connected with the pleasure of your parents. If your parents are pleasured, if your parents are happy upon you, then definitely Allah is happy upon you. If your parents are displeasured, if your parents are angry upon you, then definitely who is angry upon you? Allah is angry upon you. My dear speck of brothers, so if you really want to see your parents happy, if you really want to see Allah happy, make sure what your parents is, what happened. My dear speaker brothers, what do you get if your parents are happy? This is one of the questions that comes to our mind. So you know what? I'm going to listen to my parents, but what am I going to get? I'll tell you. One incident, yes. Yes, of course.
But look at, I, I, want, I want you to understand the reward. I want you to what? Understand what type of reward you will get. I'll tell you incidents. Rasulullah he was sitting in front of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'i. You know who are Sahabas? Yes. The companions of the Rasulullah Who has the highest rank? Abu Bakr. Who has the second highest rank? Umar radiallahu anhu. Who has the third highest rank? Usman. Okay. So they're all present there. He was sitting with what? All the highly classified Sahabas. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was present there. Umar radiallahu anhu was present there. Uthman and Ali. Everybody was present there. Rasulullah sallam sitting there. During that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Utikum. A person will come. A person will come from Yemen. From where? From Yemen. His name is Uwais ibn Amir. His name is what? Uwais ibn Amir. After I pass away. After I pass away. When you meet him, when you meet him, look at this, this, the, the most important person after Rasulullah is who? Abu Bakr. Rasulullah says, لَوْ كَانَ بَعْدِي نَبِيٌّ لَكَانَ عُمَرٌ if, if there was any prophet to come after who? Me? Would be Umar. And the most valuable person is who? Abu Bakr They both are present there. Do you understand? Abu Bakr is present there. Umar is present there. Everybody is present there. Now look at what, he, what type of advice he's telling them. It's saying that after I pass away, even though, so that means if you want to be a Sahabi, you must witness Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi with Iman. Do you understand? You must be his companion, right? But he's saying that this person will not be my companion. He will come after I pass away. He will come what? After I die. So he cannot be a companion. He's saying that he will come from Yemen. His name is going to be Uwais ibn Amir, mentioning the name. Whenever you meet him, whenever you meet him, he has such high status in the eyes of Allah. He has what? Such a high status in the eyes of Allah. Whenever he raises hands in the court of Allah, never ever Allah rejects him. So as a Sahaba, as a Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as a Umar radiallahu anhu, such a valuable individual you are. But when you meet him, make sure that you ask him to make dua for you. Do you understand? Who has the most valuable dua in this world? Rasulullah after Rasulullah who has the status, high status? The Sahaba, right? But he's instructing the Sahaba that, you know what, when a non-Sahabi come, when a foreigner come from Yemen, who's not going to be a Sahabi, but when he comes to you, make sure you are the most valuable Sahaba. Yeah, I want you to ask for forgiveness for him, from him. Doesn't that raise a question? That raises a question. That how, how did he attain that status? That Rasulullah was instructing Sahaba, Umar radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, best learn from him. Let's examine who is Uwais ibn Amr. Uwais ibn Amr, his father died at a very young age. His father died what? A very young age. He was a very small child. His mother was blind. His mother was what? Blind. His mother was blind and he was raised up by his mother. When he was raised by his mother, he had leprosy, skin disease. He has what? Skin disease, skin disease leprosy. Then he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made what? Dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, oh Allah, cure me from this leprosy, this skin disease, but make sure leave a mark on my shoulder, on my body, with the, 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 the diameter of a dirham, a coin. So every single time when I look at that place or that location of that diameter or that, that, that leprosy uh, sign that I have, will have, then I will appraise you. I will appreciate your blessings. Look at it. He's saying what? Cure me. Cure me from this skin disease, but keep a mark. Keep a mark where? On my body. So every single time I can look at it. And when I pray to you, I will thank you for the bounties and the blessings that you have bestowed upon. For him as a reminder. And one day, the Sahaba, the, the, the historians mention, at the, when did he become Muslim? He became Muslim at the hands of Sahaba. At the hands of Sahaba in Yemen. Many Sahaba went. Even Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, most prolific narrator of hadith. Abdul Rahman bin Sakhir Azdi, he's also from Yemen. He's from where? He's from Yemen. 
So at that point in time, Sahaba already migrated to Yemen. And he was there when Rasul was present. But when he accepted Islam, it is mentioned that he went to the Sahaba. And then what he, he was witnessing his mother. This is one of the verses that the Sahaba were discussing. And he was hearing this verse and he said that if Allah wants to give you nur, if Allah wants to give you direction, he does not require eyes. So he thought to himself, you know, my mother, she is blind. She's what? Blind. But at night time, she touches and story, story, fulfills all her needs, goes to the bathroom, comes back to bed, nothing. No problem is there. So he thought to himself, you know what? Allah is saying that if Allah wants to guide you, he does not need your vision. So he accepted Islam. When he accepted Islam, the trend was that whoever accepts Islam during the time of Rasulullah where do you think they go? No. They come visit and see Rasulullah because they want to be a Sahabi. Do you understand? So he was from Yemen. He was from 700 miles away. But then everybody who accepted Islam during that time when Rasulullah was present, they would all come to see Rasulullah Because when you see Rasulullah you become a Sahabi. You become what? It's a habit, you attain a higher status. But this person, Ruwais ibn Amr, even though he accepted Islam, and all his friends, all the, all the community members, they went to where? To see Rasulullah he could not go. Why do you think that is? Because of his mom? Yes. No. Because he had to take care of his mom. Now, he, he's, he's the only child, and his mom is blind. Now, if he goes to go see Rasulullah who's going to take care of his mom? Who's going to feed her? Who's going to cook for her? Who's going to take care of her? So for that reason, he stayed behind. What did he do? He stayed behind. He said, you know what? My mother comes first. My mother comes first. And he did not go to see Rasulullah He was practicing Muslim. He was practicing Muslim. And he said, you know what? I need to take care of my mother. Due to the fact that he understood the value of his mother, that he was good to his mother. He was taking care of his mother. He was being obedient to his mother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the alami arwah, like, you know, from his direction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jibreel came and he informed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you are such and such individual has accepted Islam at that point of world that where is Yemen, he could not come and see you for what reason? Because he is taking care of his mother. Due to that reason, Allah has raised his status so high that command your sahaba, command Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, command Umar radiallahu anhu that when this person comes, he's so valuable in the eyes of Allah that make sure they ask for forgiveness from him. So how did he attain that status? Hmm? Yes, by what? Being obedient to his mothers, by taking care of his mothers. It is mentioned, historians mention that Umar radiallahu anhu became Khalifa. He became what? Caliph. He became Amir al muminin And every single year, when the when the uh, when the migrants or the pe people, a caravan of Yemen would come for Hajj, he would ask, "Afiqum Awais." Every single year he would go and ask, Afiqum Awais, is Awais there among you? Every single year, because you know that his dua was accepted. He wanted to get his dua. So one day, the, the caravan of uh, Yemen came and he asked, Afikum Uwais, do we have Uwais among you? Then they said, yes, we have Uwais among us. He said, he's right there. Then he went to him and he said, Samia'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Utiq Uwais ibn Amal, that Uwais ibn Amal will come. He will come from Murad. His, his specific location will be in Murad and his tribe will be Qarab. Then are you that particular individual? Then Uwais ibn Amal said, yes, I am that particular individual. Then Umar ibn Khattab, said, Oh, Awais ibn Amal, make dua for us. Who's asking for dua? Umar ibn al Khattab is asking dua from a man Sahabi. Awais ibn Amal, who's a tabi'i? Then Awais ibn Amal said, He was surprised. <laughs> he said, You are Amir al Mu'mineen. You are the king. You are the caliph. You are the Sahaba. And he said, you are the Sahaba that Rasulullah said, you would become the next prophet if there was a prophet to come. And you are asking me to make dua? Then he said, Samir'tu Rasulullah wasallam that your status is so high, la aqsama ala Allahi la barra, that whenever you raise your hands in the court of Allah, Allah never rejects your hands. For that reason, I'm asking you to make dua. My dear speckled brothers, this is the reward that you get. 
We don't have much time, but I will tell you another incident. A recent incident. This is what Tabi'i. I will tell you. You know Sheikh Al Kalbani. <coughs> you know Sheikh Al Kalbani. He is the Imam of Haramain. He is the Imam of Mecca. He is what? Imam, imam of Mecca. He is not Saud. The king, Salman, he was pressured that all the Imam of Kaaba is Saud. You know, it's a special uh, like, you know, lineage that he had to be. But this person, he was the Imam of a Gulfan country. Per, uh, uh, Gulf in, the, in that area, Bahrain, as far as I remember. So, the king called him and says, you know what? You are the Imam of Haram from this point of day. So he called it, he is the first black Imam of Haram. He is what? The first black of Imam Haramain. He is the first individual. So in New York Times interview, he says in a New York Times interview, that is recorded, he says, they asked him, how did you become the Imam of Kaaba? What is the reason behind? And why do you think that you are the Imam of Kaaba? He said, that I have never ever dreamed because I don't have the qualification. I am not from that lineage. I am not from that family. I am not from that country. I never even dreamed that I will be the Imam of Kaaba. But one thing that I can remember, that whenever I was young, when I was, what, young, and I used to be very naughty. I used to be what? Very naughty. I used to be very mischievous. And whenever I used to do something wrong, whenever I used to do something wrong, my mom would be very upset with me. But when she was upset, she would never curse at me. She would never say bad things to me. She would make one dua. She would make what? One dua. She was also religious. That even when she's upset with her child, whenever she's upset with her child, she would not pray against them. They would, he, she would still pray for them. Many of us parents, we get tired of our kids. And we tend to think, say so many, so many bad things, my dear students, refrain from it because your dua and your saying is directly accepted by Allah. You don't want to regret later on. But this mother was so pious that even at her anger, even when she's upset, when the child is naughty, when the child is mischievous, she did not pray against him. She prayed for him. What is the dua that she made? That Imam Shaykh Al Kalbani, he mentioned that he, she made a special dua. Two duas she made. He said, Oh, Kalbani, Allah yahdik. May Allah guide you. SubhanAllah. Even though when she's upset, this is the dua she would make. She says, May Allah guide you. Allah who yadik. Allah who yaja'aluka imam al haram And may Allah make you the imam of Kaaba. <coughs> How many duas? Two duas. May Allah guide you and may Allah make you the imam of Kaaba. Look at this child, such a young age. Couple of years old. No dream of becoming the Imam. Nor the mother ever dreamed that she would be, he would become the Imam. Because it is nearly impossible. But yet, he said, this is due to the dua of my mother that I became the Imam of Kaaba. This is a recent incident. My dear respected brothers, that's what Rasulullah said, Al Jannah Tahta Qadameha. Jannah is where? Under the feet of the mother. Awsatu Abwabu Jannah wa Abuq. The widest and the biggest door of Jannah is who? Your father. Again, as I mentioned, the last hadith that I will tell you, Ridal Rabbi Biridal Walidi. If you truly want to see Allah happy, make sure your parents are what? Happy. If your parents are smiling, if your parents are happy upon you, then indeed you will know that Allah is also happy upon me. Upon me. And any dua that they make for you, Allah accepts it directly. My dear speaker, but as many of our parents have also passed away. And maybe they were upset upon us. The ulama they suggest that pray for them now. When you have that moment. Because in the Akhirah, when they will see that due to your prayers, due to your prayers, they have earned such a reward. They were maybe bound to go to hellfire, but due to your prayer, they're going to Jannah. Definitely at that moment, they will be happy. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to make our parents happy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to be obedient to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice upon what is said and compared to others. Before I conclude, does anybody have any question? Any of you have any question? No? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Make dua for me too. Make dua for me too. Your dua will be accepted, inshallah.